Attitude! We are going to energize the country. Stop Brexit! No more Mr. Nice Guy. Another future's possible, but we've got to fight for it. Order! Hello and welcome to the debated podcast. As always, I'm your host, Will. And in this episode, I'm delighted to be joined by a great comedian, Jake Yap. Welcome to the podcast, Jake. Oh, thanks very much for having me. Um, so the first question uh, that I'd like to ask is, I mean, obviously we've all been uh, impacted by uh, the pandemic, by the coronavirus. And I'm just wondering, uh, for you personally, what has the impact been like? Almost nil. Um, I mean... <laughs> Obviously, you know, you sort of hear about people you know who've, who've been ill. I'm, I'm very lucky that no one's been, been particularly badly affected in my immediate circles. Um, mm. I do know people who've had terrible times. But in terms of my life, almost nothing changed because um, I have sort of, I'd sort of I've had minimal employment for about 18 months. And I've been homeschooling my kid uh, for about a year. So... Uh, when the lockdown happened, I was kind of like, okay, welcome everyone. Uh, I've got some, <laughs> some top tips for you. But there was barely a discernible change. So, um, I mean, actually, I, had, I got more work in the first three or four months of the coronavirus than I had in, in the whole of the year before that. So, I mean, it's awful, but I, I, I had a very good, uh, I had very good coronavirus. <laughs> It's awful. I, I sort of, I suddenly realised it's like disaster capitalism. Um, my, uh, my, my grand, my great grandfather was um, Sir Charles Yap, and uh, he he had a pretty good war. He was the chairman of a company called Vickers, who landed some some pretty good contracts making bombs. Um, and so it sort of feels like I've sort of done the same. I mean, awful. I mean, I'm, you know, I've done, I sort of did the same thing because we got this six part series on Radio 4. Um, it was like the first lockdown show I, th- I think ever commissioned. Um, we were on air within 10 days of pitching and, uh, you know, it was great. We were having a great time. <laughs> it's awful. Um, but yeah, so I sort of tend to keep a bit quiet about what I'm doing because uh, everyone's having such a rotten time and. It's been fine. Sorry. <laughs> it's sort of karmic yin yang thing. Like the the whole yeah. of the rest of the world's misery has equated to moderate contentment from me. So so sorry. I th- I think John Stewart said a, a similar thing when um he was promoting his new movie that he was like arriving to a disaster with a chocolate bar. Yeah. You know, <laughs> <laughs> That's a really good yeah. It's a, yeah. My contribution to sort of try and mitigate the coronavirus has, has been dismal. You know, it wasn't it was an okay series, but I don't think anyone's <laughs> gonna remember it for all time. So yeah, sorry everyone. Sorry. <laughs> um in terms of uh impressions, which I know that obviously you do a lot of <laughs> how how have you, how have you been finding the current crop of politicians in terms of impressions and and h- how you're able to to mimic them? Oh, they're good, man. I mean, it's it's quite a vintage crop. I mean, I never I never set out to be an impressionist. That that happened. Um, I started working on Sean Keaveney's Breakfast Show on Six Music, and they asked me to do sketches every day, and it would be on news stories, and it was literally just me alone in my spare bedroom. Uh, writing and recording these things so it's not like I couldn't phone up Ronnie Ancona like there was no one there was no one there it was just me so I sort of had to do these impressions um so that was how it happens I've I never I've never sort of called myself an impressionist I always think it's quite impressive people who walk about kind of going hi I'm an impressionist <laughs> and you kind of go gosh you must be ever so good because to me I'd, I'd be like you'd have to think you're in the room with the guy you know what I mean mm. before I would say yes I'm an impressionist you know, and then and then you hear them, and they kind of go, you know, show the coronavirus, and you're like, oh, wow, you're an impressionist, are you? <laughs> so, um, but but to answer your question, I mean, fantastic, like Jacob Rees Mogg, uh, who uh, on 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 my podcast, uh, not today, thank you. Uh, I've had him as this sort of um, sort of Ray Finesy kind of, you know, the um, that film. I think it's called Red Dragon. Yeah. And it was like a prequel or something to The Silence of the Lambs. Yeah. I mean, it's horrible. Really horrible. And there's a bit at the end where I think someone's tied up and they're having terrible things done to them. And Ray Fiennes 
does this whole thing i think he's looking through photos of like awful things he's done to people he says do you see do you see the becoming do you see the becoming and i've i've had quite a lot of fun with reese mogg you know he's not just leader of the house or whatever it is he he has a dungeon you know and it's complete with the kind of kind of dripping stuff and people begging fruitlessly for their lives and i mean he's psychotic i i think he he sort of laughs to him it's all just just great fun it's great sport to watch um and i think with quite a few of these people you know they are so wealthy and so privileged that um they can it's um it is like a psychopath you know with a psychopath i feel like you know you could uh say i'm gonna i'm gonna saw off your left hand now and they'd be like oh what fun yes (laughs) yes let's watch you know and sort of chuckling at the pain because they're just not wired right you know what i mean Mm. and i think i watched reese mogg in some of the you know those really heated um parliamentary debates leading up to the election where where you know it was it was getting really nasty and you could see the sort of little smile on his face of oh how fun he he reminds me of um is it joffrey in uh game of thrones yeah you know that kind of make that one kill that one you know it's i love i mean i don't i hate it (laughs) but (laughs) there's a lot to enjoy there Mm. um and keir starmer's got a really specific voice which is great because it's got that sort of uh, kind of <laughs> it's almost like the the mouse robot in star wars yeah um uh so you know they, they are a bunch of capers and characters i mean if it wasn't for the fact that the destiny of everyone in this country hangs on them it would be hilarious <laughs> do, do you do you find sometimes that I mean, you mentioned some of the parliamentary debates um, in the uh, before the election. Do you think sometimes that it is difficult to make comedy out of situations that will, you know, affect all of our lives and, and not necessarily in a in a positive way? I f- I think it's hard. If I'm honest, I think it's really hard to make broadcast comedy at the moment because broadcasters are so frightened of. Um, doing anything that would look remotely partisan. Mm. Um, now, I understand those reasons. I'm not necessarily blaming broadcasters for that, but uh, it's it's really tough, you know. And th- the point is, right now, the Conservatives are the people who have the power. That's how it works. They're in mm. government. They govern. Therefore, they're the ones that should be getting the lion's share of the attacks. Uh, but we now have this bizarre situation in satire where, you know, I've sat in writers rooms and I've been told, well, we need to get more more stuff against the opposition in there because, you know, we, we need to be more balanced. It's like, no, 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 no. This is not a news program. <laughs> this is this is a satirical copy. We're supposed to be attacking the people in power. We're supposed to be punching up. And those people right now are the conservatives. And that's the way it should work. Should the Labour Party ever accede to power again, then they're the ones that we should be laying into the most because it's the most relevant thing. So it's really hard in the world of broadcast comedy to do something because the best satire comes from a really angry place. You know, it comes from a Mm. deep sense of uh, an injustice has been committed here. People have been wronged and, you know, lives have been affected or lost because of it and when you tap into that anger the comedy becomes really savage and it's it almost stops being funny it becomes something that sets the hairs up on the back of your neck um and i don't think broadcasters are in the mood for that they just Hmm. can't do it because they get savaged you know i mean particularly the bbc everyone's trying to tear down the bbc i understand all the reasons i I don't care (laughs) (laughs) you know but it means that the BBC is stuck in this position where they're they're sort of hobbled because whatever they do, they get accused of doing it wrong by one side mm. or the other. Do you think part of the reason that uh, we're seeing that is because of the access that people have to being able to complain much more now than perhaps at any other time in in broadcast history? You know, you can just go mm. on Twitter and and say, "Oh, I found such thing offensive," or complain about such a thing. Do you think that yeah. That m- means that comedy almost feels straight jacketed because you're afraid of the negative reaction. 
you're kind of broadcasting to the mob you know and there was there was a time where you were broadcasting to a couple of people maybe in their living room mm. and there was there's a, you know I, I, I tell you what's really underrated for its wisdom the screenplay of uh men in black very underrated uh because it's got some amazing quotes in it there's a great line where tommy lee jones says to will smith will smith saying okay so there's aliens roaming the earth and they look like humans but you know what you know people are smart they they'll get it if you told them and tommy lee jones tommy lee jones says uh no 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 a person is smart but people are stupid and i think that that's the difference you know with social media and stuff previously you were broadcasting to a person and they were quite smart they'd sit in their living room and they'd appraise it but now you're broadcasting to people who are all gathered together on twitter ready to kind of um massively amplify any kind of gripe and bring whatever petty grievance to it that that they want to um and they just they they have a higher expectation of accountability you, you could sort of just publish or broadcast something in the old days and people might not like it they might like it didn't didn't necessarily make that much difference <laughs> but now you know if people don't like it they'll they'll kill you for it and so that's why you've got <laughs> frankly really toothless satire generally at the moment because uh nobody wants to upset the apple cart so you know mm. you get people sort of capering about or you know what are the five silliest things you'd say to the queen and it's like <laughs> Who cares, man? You know, you might as well just do Cracker Jack. Why don't we all try and fish <laughs> apples out of custard? Like, who cares? It's just stupid. <laughs> Whimsy. Do you have any hopes for the uh, new series of Spitting a Pinch that's coming on later in the year? Do you think that that may be in any way similar to the original? Or do you think that that is going to suffer in the same way that a lot of other shows have done recently? I would love to believe... I would love to believe it will be good. Um, you know, people have tried to kind of do this recently. There was um, there was a series, Newsoids, yeah. that was on ITV a few years ago. I had to go writing some stuff for that, but to be honest, what I wrote was terrible. And they did the right thing, not hiring me. But uh, I don't... I think for all of those reasons, it's it's going to be really hard because you, you sort of had in spitting images heyday which to me was kind of uh, i guess the late 80s by then you had a kind of school of excellence it's kind of like why can't we do late night talk shows hmm. the reason we can't do late night talk shows is because we have absolutely no expertise in it like but genuinely, and it's the same with satire now, you actually have to try and build a college up with, um, let's take the, the talk shows analogy, right? So what you have is Stephen Colbert's or Jimmy Fallon's or, uh, you know, any of those people who are all amazing, amazing shows and the work that's poured into that. And they know how to do it. So what happens is the late show with Stephen Colbert, for example, becomes a center of excellence, you know, and if you're good then that's where you go. But there's a sort of, there's a nursery of other shows and people get practice. And, and once they get on board, once they're on in that system, there's such an infrastructure in place and a culture of it that uh, people rapidly kind of are fast-tracked into knowing how to do it. Because it's been there for 50 years. Hmm. But we don't have that infrastructure for satire anymore. We have hilarious capering about, uh, but we don't we don't know how to write satire anymore. We don't have Ian Hislop writing satire anymore. Uh, you know, he's he's got enough on his plate and he's sort of the last bastion. But do you know what I mean? You, you need that kind of yeah. angry, analytical, making a point. Actually, you know, the jokes only come from the passion of what it is you're trying to say and the way you're trying to express it. We've lost that skill set it just went it isn't anywhere now so actually what you have to do is kind of go okay we're going to do spitting image but and i said this when the mash report came out i was like great that they've commissioned it don't commission eight shows a year 
or maybe twice a year will do. What the hell? Let's go wild. <laughs> you have to make the firmest commitment imaginable. You have to say, we're going to do this. We're going to do this every week for six years. And hosts may come and go. Contributors may come and go. Writers will definitely come and go. But we're going to do it until we're good at it. But no broadcaster has that courage anymore because they have to provide some kind of instant gratification or they get killed by the mob, right? Mm. In America, they push back on that really hard. Stephen Colbert, by his own admission, he said, you know, I sucked for like two years. He was doing The Late Show and he hadn't found his voice. And he was going back to the channel and saying, I don't think I can do this. I really don't think I can do this. And the channel said, stay with it. We're behind you. Keep going. And he did. And he had that breakthrough moment in the election 2016, wasn't it? When uh, Trump yeah. got voted in and suddenly he just extemporized this amazing piece um, or semi extempore I have no idea. But he suddenly it clicked because suddenly there was the outrage and suddenly he was great and um you know there's more to it than that and you have to keep going you have to keep interrogating it but but that's my point is that level of commitment you know that channel waited two years for that moment in 2016 yeah. day in day out five nights a week like 48 weeks a year so without that commitment <laughs> You don't stand a chance. Say you commission 12 spitting images. Like week one is going to suck. It's like pancakes. The first one's just going to... Or it's going to be the banked stuff that you've spent six months writing. Week two, you've blown that. That's all gone. Week two will be terrible. Week three, you'll be hauling yourself back up from the bad reviews. Week, like week four, the end's in sight. Week five, there's only a week to go. Week six, oh, it's all over. Like you've got to... A broadcaster has to say, you know, th this can't, this has nothing to do with writing or talent or anything. It's about a broadcaster having the sheer cojones to say, okay, everyone may hate this. We may drive everyone away from this slot for two years, but we'll take the hit and we'll build it up. Sorry, I've really gone off on one. I didn't, I didn't mean to get so strident about everything. No, that's fine. <laughs> that's suddenly fine. Suddenly tapped into all of this <laughs> fury in me. <laughs> But I mean, I hope it's wonderful. Of course, I hope yeah. it's wonderful because, you know, if, if we got away some angry, brilliant, cogent, um, uh, authored satire, you know, that has a really distinctive voice yeah. and it goes to mad places, not just huh, traffic jams, you know, <laughs> but goes to really weird, dark places. My God, that would be so exciting for the industry. Do you think that there's more room for that kind of anger in stand-up than there is necessarily in sketch comedy because you know in stand-up generally you've got one person or a group a couple of people writing the material then one person performing it and, and and driving it and there isn't so much interference or, or do you think that that's a misnomer um that's a really good question i, I mean generally yes i suppose it it could be argued that stand up as a sort of lone person standing on stage having written some stuff in a miserable car park somewhere uh is going to be more authored but um that doesn't i don't think that does mean it's 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 going to be better mm. um i think that uh i think sketch comedy can be amazing i think the the problem is that um you know i think uh sometimes it's like acting right sometimes uh acting is just sort of uh remembering your lines and not bumping into the furniture like yeah. that's 98 percent of acting when you watch it you know it's perfectly fine mm -hmm. and then very occasionally you'll look at someone acting acting and you'll go oh my god that's art like that's genuinely amazing and i don't know how they did that it's yeah. rare, but I've seen it like once or twice in my life. I've like in a room, I've been somewhere and watched someone and gone, I don't know how you did that. That's extraordinary. And I think in a way it's sort of the same with comedy. Like 98% of the time you kind of go, oh yes, it's, it's this joke. It's that joke. I, I see what you're doing. That's fine. Um, and the trouble is that that comedy, which is the bulk of comedy is people sort of trying to 
you know there's trouble at the top mm. so the really established comedy on tv is it's perfectly good comedy it's just that it's um it's very very broad appeal comedy mm. Ooh, traffic jams you know it's that <laughs> but very occasionally uh you'll get the two percent comedy um with stand-up or, or in live performance where you kind of go this is something special like because i i never could have made this up in my head you know what i mean and that's mm. art that's when it becomes an art form um i would say um people like the delightful sausage you know there are moments where you look yeah. at, at their work and you kind of go I, where did that come from like i have no idea how or why you did that and yet i'm finding myself laughing and you know people like vic reeves uh you know you, you get you sometimes get sketch comedy and it's the most glorious thing and it can be the most um savage thing and and dark and and weird and um but the the problem is that it has to be the people who have the courage to kind of follow their vision or what their sort of inner voice if they found that voice and they're following that and they're ignoring the fact that what's making money right now is Michael McIntyre and traffic jams. If they're prepared to ignore that and sort of keep a steady hand on the rudder, like then then they create truly amazing things, I think. Hmm. Um, now, of course, you've done uh, quite a bit of stuff uh, with YouTube uploading things that you've <laughs> done to YouTube. Uh, do, do you think that in terms of sort of online comedy, mm. that there is more of a room to to do things that are experimental than on mainstream networks absolutely i mean it's the great democratization you know it's it's the bypassing of any kind of broadcaster producer commissioner or channel head you know nobody has to say yes that's good before you put it online uh, which can be catastrophic and has been for <laughs> countless thousands of people, but it probably including myself. But um, actually, God, yeah, it was. Oh, my God, I did a terrible... Do you want to hear my terrible thing story? Yeah. It was terrible. I did a terrible thing. It was so terrible. So this was like um, 2012, right? And this was yeah. uh, in the run-up to the Olympics. Now, the thing is, we all remember the, the Olympics retrospectively, obviously. Mm. And we all remember going, wow, it's amazing. I was so proud to be British. When does that happen? And all of that, right? Yeah. And it was great. But what everyone forgets is the utter, I mean, at best apathy, at worst contempt that we had as a nation for the Olympics in the run up. OK, we had the opening ceremony and there was the Queen and James Bond and it was brilliant and everyone went berserk. And from then on, it was just a win. But up till then, everybody hated the Olympics, man. So... I had this, what I thought was an amusing idea was that I was going to be this super enthusiastic character and I was going to do this stuff on YouTube. So I kept posting this stuff, like kind of going, oh my God, guys, 89 days to go. I cannot wait. <laughs> because I, that was hilarious back then because everyone yeah. just did not care. And I was obsessed with the mascots, Wenlock and Mandeville. Uh, yeah. Well, I loved Wenlock, Mandeville. <laughs> whatever but Wenlock <laughs> excellent and even though they're indistinguishable from each other so, so, but that was the whole point I was just obsessed mm, yeah. you know I found an Olympic biscuit look what I found in Sainsbury's and all of this so uh, a friend sent me um, because he'd been enjoying these videos sent me a cuddly Wenlock and Mandeville and it was so exciting and I opened it and uh, I said to Kim my partner I know exactly what to do with these and I went into the spare bedroom and I re-emerged about half an hour later. And I'd filmed this thing with Wenlock and Mandeville uh, of the two of them having a great time. Uh, they were dressed as beef eaters. I don't know why they were dressed as beef eaters. That's how they came. I hadn't dressed them up as beef eaters. Um, and it starts with Wenlock parading them down and going, pump, 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 pump. Bump, bump, and then Mandeville comes on and goes, hey! And Wenlock says, who's this? Who's this crazy cat? Uh, and Mandeville says, hey, I'm just like you. I'm Mandeville. You suck! <laughs> and I have Wenlock just go, you suck! Uh, oh, yeah, I guess I do. Yeah, you do! <laughs> and then it turned into this sort of very aggressive lovemaking scene, <laughs> which both of them were enjoying heartily, I'm anxious to say. 
uh, they both felt it was the right thing to do <laughs> and they were having a wonderful time. Um, and then I just sort of ended by turning them to the camera and just saying, um, these make excellent toys for children. <laughs> so I put it out and it was starting to really take off. Um, I could feel that kind of um, almost roller coaster acceleration of, yeah. of kind of, oh, this is going to go big. This is going to go really big. Like the counts were really racking up fast in the, yeah. like in the opening hour or so. And um, I was thinking, oh, my God, like I've got I've got I've got a proper I've got a proper hit on my hands here. And then. I suddenly sort of the, the happy little bubble that I was existing in burst when I got a text from my boss who was the head of a radio station um a, a bbc radio station saying you need to take that video down now and we'll talk in the morning <laughs> and i was like oh god and suddenly there's that kind of boing you know that zoom in track yeah. out shot where the background goes all warpy around your yeah. head um I had that and I was like, oh my God, what was I thinking? What have I done? <laughs> and uh, I had to go in the next day and do my radio show, which yeah. I did. And it was terrible. It was much more Mandeville than Wenlock. And I had to go into her office and she absolutely tore me a new one saying, um, you know, the BBC is an Olympic broadcast. You brought us into disrepute. What on earth are you thinking? You're employed here as a journalist. And the shame you brought on this institute. I was like, I love the BBC. Please don't think I like, I, please. I'm so sorry. And she just went on and on and on until, until I literally cried. Like wow. I, I, I broke down in tears. I was what? 38 cried in a meeting uh, and said, I'm sorry. <clears throat> and I left shortly after that. Anyway, the point is, <laughs> um, you know, you can do these things. You can do these mad things online and nobody's going to say you can't do that. I never could have done yeah. that on the BBC. I couldn't have done that on any broadcast platform. But, you know, those that saw it, and I think I put it back up after I left, uh, you know, they loved it. And, and, and you can do that. You're never going to make a living out of it, but you can do it. Yeah. Um, one of the other things that I know that you're particularly... Um, good at is <laughs> music is, yeah I'm going uh, musical yes. uh, comedy how yes. much do you think musical comedy is sort of thought of in in terms of when people think of, of comedy do you think it's sort of seen as like a, a you know like a, a long lost sibling or, or do you think it, it, it it's no, seen perhaps it's... in a, a positive light I think it's how seen think? as like your elderly great aunt who everyone's very fond of because she's so sweet but you know well we'll sit through it because it's christmas like <clears throat> it's sort of like um an after eight mint isn't it it's, it's always yeah. generally at the end of a show like oh we'll end on a thong <laughs> and no one really likes it I mean, no one really likes after eight mints do they <laughs> like it's toothpaste with an sort of atom thin molecule of chocolate sprayed over it but you you eat it because it's there you know and it's it's inoffensive enough <laughs> and i think i think that you know topical comedy songs particularly topical comedy songs generally suck so hard i mean you might as well say i've written a poem like it's the worst thing you can inflict on someone generally so i take it very seriously <laughs> like if i'm gonna write a comedy song like i feel like this has to be really good um and particularly if you're if ever you're going to parody something my feeling is you've got to, to you ha have a mandate to make it better than whatever it is you're parodying because mm. otherwise what's the point you know you're just doing a rubbish facsimile of something so um i take it really seriously doing a parody and the problem with musical comedy is that uh in some ways uh the two sit very harmoniously in terms of uh rhythm you know, where mm. you know, bumba da bumba da bumba da bump, that's where the punchline's going to land. And if you do it right, it's magical. Where they fight each other is repetition, if you're not careful. I mean, there are ways of doing it, but, um, mm. you know, music and the structure of a song often relies on repetition. Um, 
and that kills comedy no one wants to hear a joke four times like it's just not going to be funny anymore so now we're just sitting through it pleasantly you know what i mean so yeah if you're giving people if you're making people listen to that joke four times by god it's gonna have to literally be the best joke in the world or you have to find a way for it to work like the the classic example of um a brilliant way to make that work for you is the noel coward song and your mother came too do you know that Mm. song yeah yeah like perfect where you have that amazing twist at the end Mm. it's genius and jazz songs or show tunes work really well for musical comedy because um i think they understand that often you've got that kind of um you'll have that motif but you know a verse will kind of go a a a b in terms of its rhyme structure Mm. whereas other songs will kind of go a b a b um but going a a a b with some kind of um uh some line at the end you know yeah so you have like three rhymes the same and then you end on and that's why they all have to die you know whatever it is uh you know that 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 could work Mm. but um yeah i mean i just yeah it's one of those things i think i i do it but with a very strong sense of shame and (laughs) (laughs) and offense but i i (laughs) i um you know I, i i do I do craft them as much as I can. Oh, the the funny thing, you know, at the moment I do this podcast. It's a daily podcast. I do it five mornings a week and I'll do songs on that quite often. And generally they're good. And I'll take, I'll generally take a couple of days to kind of actually get them properly to, mm. to fitness. But, um, you know, once in a blue moon, you put something out and you're like, this isn't really good enough. But, um, and that's excruciating. That's just the worst feeling. Um, but yeah, there's some good ones. Um, now, something that we've touched upon a bit has been <laughs> the restraint that sometimes comedians feel. And at the moment, there's quite a bit of backlash from some comedians about the um, Scottish government's um, hate crimes law uh, in, in, in regards to you know what what is acceptable and what is considered a, a, a hate crime. Mm. Do you think that this is a a dangerous area to codify in in terms of the way that it relates to to comedy and music or do you think that it's acceptable to have some sort of particular standard as to what is acceptable <laughs> to say and, and and to make jokes about or, and, and what isn't ah uh, ah uh, i mean there are very few comedians out there who would say literally any word on stage Mm. right yeah every comedian i bet you has one or two words (laughs) that they're just under any second if they're if there's anything okay in their head like they're just never gonna say right Mm. so if you've agreed that then in principle you agree that by common consensus (laughs) we are gonna censor ourselves a little bit Mm. so just say well i should be able to say anything no one's going to go on stage and say, okay, we all know what it is, that word, right? No one's yeah. going to say it. They're going to swear their head off, but they ain't going to say that. And, you know, the guy who played Kramer in Seinfeld famously said that oh, yeah. on stage and was trying to make the point. This is just a word. How about we try and dissipate its potency as a hateful thing? And look how well that went for him. Like, oh, yeah. no one's going to do it. <laughs> um, and I think... So, so, uh, formalizing that is, it's dodgy because I, th- I, I think really you ought to be able to decide for yourself where you want to go and how far you want to go. And, but the, the, the thing really to interrogate more than anything is, is the intent because the intent is everything. If, if your intent is good, if what you're doing with your joke is trying to illuminate or uh you know emphasize a point or to try to uh attempt some kind of sense of restitution for an Mm. aggrieved party uh then then that's fine 
if you're just doing it for cheap shock value, then yeah, you should be hounded out of town. Do you think that that is as much as an issue in terms of caricatures? Because whether it be impressions or um, caricatures as in, as in drawing, because I know that there mm. are people who will obviously object to particular people being oh, okay, yeah. at drum or, 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 or caricatured in a, a, a specific way. Do you think that is the same sort of <clears throat> area? <sighs> I mean, thanks for that one. But, uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, I think... I think um, people who have historically um, been stereotyped in hateful, spiteful ways. So um, uh, black people, Jewish people, women, you know, on we go. Uh, Yeah. The question you want to ask, I think, is um, what is what for you is your dream end game? Like, what would be the ultimate outcome that you would hope for? Mm. And I don't know. And I should ask and listen more as a white cis male. Um, I would imagine that the utopia that we would all like to live in would be one where people would look at a caricature, a stereotype, and not even see it, like not Mm. even understand it because the whole thing is so far removed from their sensibilities that they'd be like, I I don't know. It just looks like a, I don't know. What is that? They wouldn't go, oh yeah, that's a Jew. That's a black person. You know what I mean? They just kind of go, I don't know. It's just a weird drawing. Surely that would be the ideal where the whole idea of racism or anti-Semitism or whatever is now so far gone and erased from our consciousness that when presented with it, we wouldn't even see it. Hmm. (laughs) Here's the problem is that (laughs) in a, in a way, part of me is there like you know jeremy corbyn yeah got a lot of stick because he liked a cartoon that a cartoonist had drawn of some bankers yeah and i think i i don't know i don't remember and forgive me and i'm definitely not trying to cause offense but i think some of them had big noses and were accused of being jewish stereotypes and that the whole thing was anti-semitic yeah i i saw the cartoon and i just didn't see it and i'm not saying it wasn't there but what i'm Mm. saying is that i've reached a point where like jewish people are just people so i didn't look at these bankers and think oh jews like i didn't it didn't occur to me yeah naive as i am perhaps but surely that's a naivety that we'd all like (laughs) the world to get to wouldn't we Mm. so so here's the problem. Now, with all the debate and the furore that surrounded that, now if I see a cartoon of bankers, I think, oh, that's probably anti-Semitic. Or, you know, I'm looking out for all of those things. All of those things, those tropes, those racist, offensive, horrible tropes have been reinforced more by the outrage than the original artist, if that was their intention, ever could have dreamed of. Because it's been amplified. So, like, I showed my kid uh, Asterix, right? He's seven years old. And it was one of the old Asterixes. And uh, he was reading it and having a great time. And uh, there's pirates in it. Um, One of the pirates is black. And it is a catastrophically racist character of a black person. (laughs) It is. And he looked at it and went, that's a funny man. I said, yeah, do you, you know, what, who do you think it is? He said, I don't don't know. I don't, I don't don't know. It's just a weird drawing. And I was like, yeah, he didn't think, oh, there's a black person. (laughs) He was literally like, I I, I don't, I don't really know how to read this. 
<laughs> Surely mm. that's where we kind of want to be, where he, he didn't understand it as being something racist. I mean, perhaps he should. You know, there's the other side of the debate. It's to kind of go, well, you, you need to learn about the oppression. And I'm sure all of that will come, but... <sighs> Do you see what I mean? Like with the caricature yeah. thing, I feel like, and and I understand the whole dog whistle thing, but these are just sad little people hunched over their little computers in their houses and and nuts to them. Like, I don't care <laughs> in terms of then these people aren't relevant, and I don't want them to feel like they are. I don't want to give mm. them the status of saying they're important because they're not. I mean, in 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 terms of caricatures one of the things i was uh, th- thinking about with the question mm. uh, was also steve bell who's recently um left the guardian been uh, sacked from the guardian oh, really? and yeah and people have for a while been complaining about his um caricatures that the one that he uh, did of uh pretty patel and, and and obviously uh ones of um jewish people right. as well do you think that Part of the issue in terms of recognition, you talk about um, a, a, a sort of like a sense of naivety in, in, in seeing it and not making it a, a, a pre-supposition uh, uh, when you see them. Do you think part of it is just that it's not something that is taught as much from, say, a, a basic level, from say, from, from schools in, in, t- in terms of recognition of... of uh, stereotypes and do you think that that is something that should be done or or what do you think if you really want to drill down into it right with the caricature thing whether you're talking about Priti Patel or Ed Miliband or any of these people that you know people have objected to cartoons of you know earlier I was talking about Stephen Colbert and saying you know I think there's still work to be done and I think there is still work to be done Stephen Colbert um, regularly makes jokes about Trump being fat. Mm. He'll just do a little throwaway line about "Mm, awful fat, you know, and everybody laughs. Is that really the best joke you can make about Trump? Like, is that the best you got with all of the atrocities Mm. he's committed? All of the terrible things he said and his heinous deeds fat like is that is that the best you've got and i think that with caricature it's the same thing like is that is that the best you got for your joke because that's not valid you Mm. know making making something funny out of someone's appearance yeah by all means attack trump for being orange and his comb over because he's that's elective you know he's chosen those things so go to town on that but people can't help the colour. You know, it's very, these are basic rules of comedy. So I think in terms of caricature, actually, those rules are still valid. You know, if Pretty Patel wants to wear unflattering outfits or something, fine. You I'm, can I'm, do that. But, but I think that, you know, caricature at its best is going to illuminate and make a point. But if you're just doing... A funny picture because someone's got a slightly large nose so you draw a massive nose i mean is that how funny is that really hmm. and and is it a valid joke you know yeah so i think that's um, where i stand on it <laughs> so like, <laughs> make make your other jokes count you shouldn't you shouldn't really need to do that coming towards the end of the podcast try and end on something a bit lighter. Yeah, uh, <laughs> coming towards the end of the podcast and i've got one um final uh question oh for you oh now you've talked you've the talked pressure. about um yes. the the lockdown not being as perhaps as you know as, as much of a, a change for you than say for other people mm. um what one positive thing do you think has come out of it for for you for me um yeah. <clears throat> this is awful but um i i um I got I got a bit fitter. Um, I, I I did Joe Wicks and I I hated him every day. Um, and then occasionally, you know, I'd read something about him and go, "Oh, he's really nice," and I'm happy for him. 
Um, and I resented that a lot because I wanted to just hate him. <laughs> and now I'm not even allowed to because he's a sweet guy who's had a hard life. God, I hate that. But um, so um, I, I did Joe Wicks every day uh, and now uh, I'm going for runs and things. Um, and, I, you know, I have, I have got a bit... I mean, nothing, you know, don't worry. It's nothing drastic. I'll still keel over within the next 10 years. But, um, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, and, and from that's emerged a new character. I've started doing a new character, uh, Lee Hardlywell, who is sort of uh, a fitness instructor, a very fragile man. Um, I'm, I'm not saying what the inspiration was from that. You'll <laughs> never work it out. But uh, <laughs> so he's always sort of saying, you know, Okay, guys, you know, just just remember um, all the effort you put in today uh, will count for absolutely nothing tomorrow. Uh, <laughs> just if we start again at the bottom of the hill. Oh, God, it never ends. Uh, so it's, that's because <laughs> Joe Wicks feels like this very frail character. There's something about the way he'd say good luck at the end of, of every workout. And you think, why, why do I need good luck? Joe, what, what's going on, Joe? Are you okay, Joe? <laughs> So um, I've, I've I've put him uh, P E with Lee P E with Lee, not P with Lee. All right, it's very. Um, I've got that on Instagram and Twitter now. If anyone wanted to follow that and watch me doing funny workouts, which I'm going to start putting on, I'd be pathetically grateful. Well, um, I think that's a that's that's a great thing to have uh, uh, achieved and and something that you can. <laughs> A new, a new fount of comedy that hopefully people yeah. listening will will go and check out. Uh, thank yeah. you once again. For oh, coming thanks on the so podcast. much for having me. I'm- thank you for listening to the podcast. Don't forget that you can subscribe on iTunes, Spotify, Podbean, or YouTube. You can follow us at Debated Podcast on Twitter, like us, Debated Podcast on Facebook. And if you want to email us, either about appearing or making a comment or reaction to the episode you've heard or any other episodes, then email us thedebatedpodcast at gmail.com. Thank you for listening. I hope you listen to the next one.